Let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my, my name, name is Joanna Lee. Lee. I'm an attorney and mediator and consultant, consultant and I work with open source foundations and projects and communities. And, communities. and, and one, one of the many things I do to help support projects and communities is, is help develop code, code of conduct processes um, and, and assist, assist with, with code of conduct incident and response. response. So uh, some, some of the things we'll talk about today, uh, we'll, we'll talk, talk about the role of code of conduct responders and why this work is so important. Uh, how uh, codes of conduct have, have been evolving and how they continue to evolve. Uh, we'll, we'll also talk, talk about some of the risks associated with co code, code of conduct incident response, uh, in particular legal risks. Uh, so some of you may be aware that there is a pending lawsuit against the organizers of DEF CON um, uh, arising from a code of conduct incident. So we'll, we'll talk about that a uh, bit today as well. Uh, we'll also talk about fairness and best practices throughout the code of conduct incident response process. Um, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about uh, restorative, restorative justice and transformative justice frameworks and how those can apply in code of conduct incident response, uh, or the role of mediation in code of conduct uh, response, uh, and uh, some tips for managing communications uh, throughout the process. Uh, how many people in this room are code of conduct responders? Great. Uh, how, how many, many of you are thinking, thinking about, about volunteering uh, to help, help with code of conduct response? response. Awesome. Um, well, well, for those of you who are thinking about this work or who have done this work um, or doing this work, work, thank you so much. This, this is really, really, really hard, hard work. work. Um, and, and it's, it's also, also very important. important. So, so it's, it's emotionally, emotionally taxing. Um, with, with any incident, incident however you resolve it, you almost certainly can't make everybody happy. It can be stressful. It's time consuming. Um, you're, um, you're often, often dealing, dealing with, with uh, stressful, stressful situations, situations and uh, conflict and, and sometimes emotionally distraught people. people. Um, so, so it's very, very important work. work. Uh, part, part of the role of Code of Conduct Responders, responders is to help safeguard um, the health and safety uh, of communities and ensure that they are welcoming safe spaces for everybody. Uh, incident response can impact both the reality and perception of whether a community is a safe space. Uh, and, and the decisions, decisions that you make as incident responders, responders can also impact people's careers. careers. Um, the decision, the ability, the ability to ban somebody, somebody from uh, an event or from a community, community either on a temporary or uh, long-term basis, basis, should not be taken lightly. So code of conduct incident responders can't make everybody happy. This is an inherently controversial uh, line of volunteer work. Um, whatever decision you make about how to resolve an incident, um, there's, there's almost, almost always, always going to be somebody who's very unhappy with the result. And some violations can be very public in nature and very divisive within a community. And any failure to follow best practice and implement due process um, will be scrutinized and criticized by the community um, and can increase both legal and community health risks. Uh, so, so actual fairness, fairness is really essential, and, and the optics really matter as well. Uh, let's talk about how codes of conduct uh, have evolved and continue to evolve. So roughly 10 years ago, codes of conduct were a relatively novel concept in open source. Uh, it could be an uphill battle just to get a community to adopt a code of conduct. And in recent years, codes of conduct have become quite pervasive. Um, most uh, communities, communities and projects have codes of conduct. Of conduct. Um, but it's, it's becoming increasingly recognized that just having a code of conduct isn't enough. enough. How, how you enforce it, it uh, who, who enforces it, it uh, how, how you go, go about, about resolving, resolving uh, incidents, um, how clear your documentation is, transparency, um, all of these factors matter as well. Uh, most, most community, well, well many, many communities, communities, communities with, with uh, mature <laughs> governance structures tend to have a code of conduct committee that oversees incident response, uh, along with published documentation that details the procedures um, from beginning of receiving a report to uh, the end when it's resolved uh, and the results are communicated to the accused person and to those who reported. Uh, and code of conduct incident resolution uh, is continuing to evolve and it will continue to, and it will continue to evolve in response to uh, social, political, and philosophical movements such as uh, theories of justice, transformative justice, and restorative justice. 
Uh, also, uh, it will continue and is evolving in response to uh, developments in social science and psychology, uh, including uh, thinking and best practices in trauma-informed care. There are risks associated with code of conduct incident resolution, uh, including legal risks and lawsuits. Uh, also, community health risks. Uh, if a code of conduct incident is not handled in a way that is seen to be uh, fair and transparent, um, it can become very, very heated and politically divisive within a community. Um, and a community can lose confidence in leadership or the governance pro processes, and the code of conduct may be perceived as um, something that's not that meaningful or, or even something that's uh, a used as a weapon. Um, so, uh, particularly because uh, there is a pending code of conduct lawsuit that some of you may have heard about, we'll talk a little bit more about that, the DEF CON lawsuit, um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on legal risks today than I have historically when I've given the same presentation. So for minor types of code of conduct violations, uh, such as just rudeness, um, the legal risks are typically very, very low. Um, but, but when, when we're, we're uh, dealing, dealing with, with uh, more severe types of uh, violations such as physical assault or sexual harassment um, or uh, identity-based discrimination, um, the risk to the community, the hosting foundation, code of conduct responders, and um, the risk of, of uh, legal liability in lawsuits increases. So lawsuits can be brought by the accused person for uh, defamation, libel, and slander. Uh, also, tortious interference for contractual or economic relations. If, um, if the re results of the, uh, the code of conduct investigation somehow damage their relationships with customers, vendors, um, others um, in their, in their um, economic sphere. Uh, also, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, lawsuits can also be brought by a party who was injured uh, as a result of the incident. Um, and if an employee or, or multiple employees of the hosting foundation um, are, uh, are victims of harassment, um, a code of conduct incident can also uh, create risks of hostile work environment claims and other employment related claims. Uh, so these are, these are some of the factors that uh, increase uh, legal risk. So if somebody suffered physical harm, uh, the person accused of a violation is a community leader or an employee or contractor of the hosting foundation. Um, if the remedy uh, could meaningfully impact somebody's career. Um, also, if there are public statements made about an individual that could harm their reputation. Uh, so there is a, uh, some of you may have, uh, may already be aware that there is a pending lawsuit against the organizers of DEF CON, um, which is an annual hacker conference. Um, and there's still so much that's not known about uh, the incident, the, the underlying incident that was investigated and, and, and the lawsuit itself. So I'm not going to comment on the merits of the lawsuit or the incident or how it was handled. Um, but I do want to uh, talk about the basics of the lawsuit, what's, what is publicly known, uh, just as uh, to provide an example of the type of lawsuit that can come up um, from uh, incident response and, and how it's handled. So earlier this year, the organizers of DEF CON uh, informed uh, Chris Hadnagy, uh, who's a DEF CON village host, uh, that he wouldn't be allowed to attend, contribute to, or participate in the event moving forward uh, due to alleged violations of the DEF CON's code of conduct. And so that's both uh, the event that took place this year and then, and then future conferences um, in perpetuity. Uh, and additionally, they made a public statement on their website in a transparency report um, saying that uh, they received multiple uh, code of conduct violations about a DEF CON village leader, and they named uh, the accused person um, in this public transparency report on their website. Um, and they've, um, <clears throat> and uh, they haven't uh, described the nature of the uh, violation of the code of conduct, but they have said that, that these are severe enough that it warrants a permanent ban. So in August of this year, uh, Chris Hadnagy, the accused person um, in that code of conduct incident, uh, and uh, a company that he is a founder and CEO of, Social uh, Engineer LLC, filed a lawsuit against uh, both DEF CON, Communications Inc., the organizer of the conference, and uh, its president, Jeff Moss. 
Um, and the claims brought by Chris Hadnagy include uh, defamation, intentional and tortious interference with contractual relations, uh, invasion of privacy in false light, uh, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. So in addition to denying that he violated the code of conduct, uh, Chris Hadnagy's complaint uh, further alleges that um, the transparency report, uh, the public transparency report on DEF CON's website, uh, created a firestorm of social media and Twitter uh, commentary um, that uh, damaged his reputation, that because of the vague statements that were made on the website, uh, many in the community have assumed the very worst about uh, what the nature of the violation was, um, and have assumed that there must have been some type of sexual harassment or sexual assault leading to the band. Um, and that uh, these statements damaged his reputation, had a harmful impact on his business dealings, uh, caused some of his customers to terminate their relationship um, with his company. Um, and uh, furthermore, the complaint alleged that uh, Chris had requested numerous times information about uh, about what the what the actions were that he allegedly took that resulted in this finding of a code of conduct violation, um, and that uh, the organizers of DEFCON had never provided that information. And in defense, uh, DEFCON Communications has asserted that. The public statements made uh, about uh, Chris Hadnagy's behavior are absolutely true, um, and that an ex-employee of uh, Chris Hadnagy's company uh, was the one who came forward and, uh, and complained about, uh, about harassment um, uh, from Chris uh, to, to that ex-employee um, that was precipitated by that ex-employee trying to leave uh, the company. Um, and DEF CON Communications uh, further alleged that they had talked with at least half a dozen other members of the hacking community who described similar inappropriate behavior. Uh, so where the case is now um, is that uh, the organizers of DEF CON plan to file a motion to dismiss uh, in October, uh, and they're going to be challenging personal jurisdiction as well as a legal sufficiency of Chris Hadnagy's claims. Um, and if the motion is denied, the parties will proceed with discovery. Um, uh, something to keep in mind when uh, this proceeds with discovery, um, there's, so there's generally, when, co when in, in code of conduct incident response, there's almost always a promise that we make both explicitly and implicitly um, to reporters in the community of confidentiality. Um, because we, we want to protect community members from retaliation. We want to create a safe environment in which people can report. Uh, alleged violations. Um, when there's litigation, um, that is sometimes impossible because during discovery, um, you know, uh, with rare exceptions where there might be attorney-client privilege involved in you know, communications with counsel or if counsel performed, uh, external counsel performed uh, the investigation, um, you know, some of those uh, investigative materials and reports may be privileged. Um, but in general, in, in most situations where you have community, volunteer community members performing an investigation, um, it's, very, it's very difficult to um, withhold uh, those investigative documents um, in, in the course of a lawsuit. Um, so this is one of those uh, exceptions to confidentiality and code of conduct uh, response, and, and partly why um, you know, lawsuits are um, they're stressful, they're time-consuming, they're expensive, um, but the other uh, adverse consequence is that it's very hard to protect reporters and victims' confidentiality when there is a lawsuit. Um, so if this lawsuit proceeds and it's not dismissed, um, uh, there will be discovery and uh, every aspect of the investigation is going to be very, very carefully scrutinized. Um, the plaintiff is going to you know, attack any potential, um, any, any, uh, any issue um, in due process and fairness. They're going to be scrutinizing credibility of witnesses and reporters. Um, uh, as well as uh, motivations and potential conflicts of interest uh, of the people who were involved in the investigation um, and the ultimate decision to, to ban Chris Tadnagy. Um, and again, there's still a lot we don't know about, um, about the code of conduct violation itself, 
uh, the investigation, uh, the lawsuit. It's possible more information will come out later. Um, in, uh, at the member summit, the Linux Foundation member summit in Lake Tahoe in November, um, I will be doing a much deeper dive into both this lawsuit um, and, a, and a focused presentation on how to uh, avoid litigation and manage legal risks uh, in code of conduct enforcement. Uh, let's talk about fairness and due process throughout code of con conduct uh, incident response. So this is what fairness and due process looks like from beginning to end. Um, so everyone needs to have notice of the rules of acceptable behavior, and that's usually expressed in the code of conduct itself. Um, and of course, it's important that the code of conduct be um, published, uh, readily available um, to, to everybody who participates in the community. Uh, the process for enforcement should be clear and transparent. Uh, the investigation and evaluation needs to be thorough. Uh, all relevant and available evidence should be considered. Um, and if consequences beyond a warning, um, or in some cases, uh, uh, temporary suspension are under consideration, um, in a vast majority of cases, it's really important that the accused be given an opportunity to be heard and present their own evidence. Um, there are some exceptions where that might create a community health or safety risk or uh, an undue risk of retaliation, uh, but in general, giving the accused person the opportunity to present their own evidence is, is, a, is a critical, um, critical uh, component of fairness and due process. Um, it is important that the triers of fact be impartial um, and that conflicts of interest be dealt with appropriately. Uh, it's also important that a code of conduct be applied consistently. Um, so you can't, uh, you know, you're not going to treat um, one person who ha engaged in a particular type of behavior uh, one way and somebody else who engaged in the same behavior a different way because one of them is more popular um, or has a different identity. Um, if a violation is found, uh, it's important that the determination be communicated in a way that allows the accused person to understand why their behavior was not acceptable. Um, and what the impact was on the community. Um, there are some rare exceptions, um, but, but that, those are exceptions rather than the rule. Um, and any consequences should be appropriate given the severity of the behavior and the impact uh, to the community. So you know, it, would be, it would be pretty extreme to ban somebody permanently um, you know, because of one or two rude remarks. Um, but if there's a pattern of um, consistent behavior or the severity is such that it creates a community health and safety issue, um, perhaps a permanent ban is appropriate. Um, so here are some, some things that your code of conduct documentation should address if it doesn't already. Uh, so obviously what behavior is acceptable and what's not? Um, what's the process for reporting violations? Um, there are still so many uh, communities and projects I come across with uh, codes of conduct, but there's no clear process for who do I report to, how do I report, who is responsible for responding to and resolving code of conduct incidents. Um, this is, uh, again, a, a, an important part of transparency. Um, it's, it, it's not a safe space for reporting if it's not, it can't be known to the reporter who's going to receive that report, because what if it's somebody on the code of conduct committee um, that's an accused person or, or an involved person. Um, also a policy for dealing with conflicts of interest. So what is a conflict of interest? Um, what's the process for recusal, um, et cetera? Um, also, uh, what are your policies related to protecting the anonymity of reporters uh, and, and victims um, and targets of the alleged wrongdoing? Uh, your code of conduct documentation al should also address uh, whether the code of conduct can be enforced respect with respect to actions that take place outside of community spaces, if those actions are likely to impact community health. Um, I can think of uh, numerous of instances of where there's, there is harassment um, taking place um, uh, in, in social media. Um, it could be on Facebook or Twitter or in a Slack channel, um, although a Slack channel, of course, is a, is a community space, but there may be other spaces or there could be um, uh, harassment taking place uh, at an uh, off-site sponsor, uh, sponsored event that's co-located with a conference or an association with a conference but is not technically a community space. Um, and uh, if, if it has an impact on community, um, it, it, it can be helpful for the uh, Code of Conduct to clarify um, that, it ha that it, its jurisdiction is broad enough to reach those spaces. Uh, if you do have an appeal process, uh, make sure that's doc well documented. Um, 
And also document your code of conduct committee's ability to delegate or escalate uh, investigation or incident resolution. Um, for example, if everybody in the code of conduct committee has a conflict of interest, um, this does occasionally arise. Um, how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to pull in alternates or, or, or escalate um, or perhaps hire an outside investigator? Um, also, uh, this is something that I think is very, very rarely documented, even in communities with very mature governance structures. How does your code of conduct enforcement team fit within the larger governance structure of your project? Um, what's the scope of its, uh, jur its uh, jurisdiction and authority relative um, to uh, the technical leadership bodies and the governing board, for example? Um, a few uh, tips on navigating uh, conflicts of interest and impartiality. Um, so the following uh, are examples of people who would have conflicts of interest and should not participate um, in the uh, Code of Conduct Incident Response Team investigation, uh, other than as a, as a witness. So the, obviously the accused person, um, anyone who is a direct victim or target of the incident, uh, anyone who has a close uh, personal or professional relationship with either uh, a victim or, um, or the accused person. Um, I'd also encourage you to consider distinguishing between hard conflicts and soft conflicts. Um, for example, some communities uh, have this idea of a car hard conflict. You know, anything on this list would be a hard conflict and that person could not even just participate in discussions um, about the incident. So they would have to be completely recused from all discussions. Um, and sometimes there are soft conflicts where, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a, um, a friendship, but it's not a very close friendship. Um, maybe there's some type of professional relationship, but there's not a direct supervisory relationship. They work in completely different uh, divisions of the company and rarely in interact. Um, and you know, those people, it can be helpful to have them in the room to talk about the incident, um, but they shouldn't be allowed to vote because um, even the perception of bias um, in voting could, um, could, could taint perceptions of, of whether this is truly a fair uh, decision-making process. Uh, it's important to have options for escalation and uh, delegation. Um, as I mentioned before, in, in some cases, uh, there are no uh, members of the Code of Conduct Committee who don't have conflicts of interest. Um, and then in some situations, there's such heightened legal risk that um, it may be really important to involve foundation staff or an external professional investigator or mediator um, in uh, incident resolution. Um, you know, we talked about the DEF CON uh, lawsuit and, um, and uh, the fact that there are going to be a lot of investigative materials, you know, if they proceed with discovery, that are going to be discoverable. Um, part, one of the many advantages of having an external um, law firm or investigator perform an investigation is that um, there will be attorney-client privilege um, that covers many of the communications between um, the responders and, um, and that investigative firm or counsel. Um, and also, if it is a high risk incident um, that it could result in litigation, um, having legal counsel involved every step of the way is really, really important um, because they can always be looking at a lens from a lens of, okay, um, you know, if we go about it this way, how is that going to look in, in, if there's a lawsuit? Um, and uh, <clears throat> having that advice is um, um, something that's, I think, really, really critical um, when the, the legal risks are higher. Uh, we talked a little bit about consistency earlier. Um, so you treat similar violations similarly. Um, and whenever you are um, making a decision about what consequence to apply when a violation is found, uh, keep in mind that you're setting precedent. You are setting precedent for how future behavior of a similar nature is going to be treated. Um, it's important to balance transparency and privacy. You know, in open source, there's so much. Um, we value transparency and openness so much. Um, but here there are, are there other interests as well. Um, it's in order to create a safe space for reporting, it's so important that uh, victims and reporters and witnesses' uh, identities uh, and anonymity is protected. Um, if, if it's not, uh, community members may be unwilling to uh, submit reports. 
Um, so it's helpful to design an anonymous reporting mechanism as an option for, for people um, who are uncomfortable um, who are uncomfortable uh, having their identity known to the entire Code of Conduct Committee. Um, and the report, investigation notes, and all deliberations of the Code of Conduct Committee also need to be kept confidential. Um, we'll talk about communications um, later. Uh, in some situations, your Code of Conduct Committee might decide to make a public announcement um, at, the, at the conclusion of an investigation, but if that's the case, that needs to be a group decision-making process, not something that, uh, that committee members decide uh, on unilaterally while an investigation is, uh, is still pending. Uh, so this is the uh, this is sort of a map of the uh, code of conduct process. You know, first you receive a report, or you learn that there is a, a potential incident. Uh, then there's uh, an investigation. Um, sometimes there's a there's a mediation that helps resolve the dispute uh, if it's more of the nature of an interpersonal conflict, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, evaluating, determining what the consequences or remedies are if a violation was found, and then communicating the results to the reporters. Um, and to the accused person, and, and in some cases, to the broader community. Uh, when performing the investigation, um, it uh, will sometimes be necessary to, to interview the accused person um, uh, and the victim or target and, and all known witnesses. Again, part of fairness is considering all available evidence. Um, so, and that means uh, interviewing all people who might have important information who are willing to be interviewed. In some cases, there will be people who are unwilling to speak with the Code of Conduct Committee. Um, but if they are willing and they might have uh, relevant information, uh, it's important to give them an opportunity um, to, to be heard. Uh, care should be taken in deciding who's going to perform the interviews and whether to have one person or multiple people conduct the interviews. Um, where there is a higher risk of the accused person being rude or abusive, um, uh, consider having more than one person present so that there's uh, an additional person both for support and as a witness. Um, and also be, be thoughtful about how to frame the request for a meeting um, and how much information to volunteer in advance. Uh, because in some cases, uh, you know, notifying an accused person that they're under investigation can create a risk of either retaliation or tampering with evidence um, or destruction of evidence and uh, tampering with uh, other witnesses. Uh, make sure to take careful notes um, and keep, uh, keep documents. Um, and yeah, of course, ask, ask all involved parties for any supporting documentation or evidence that they have for you to review. Uh, when conducting an interview, uh, find a safe, quiet space. Um, if the incident just occurred and you're, you're speaking with somebody who's uh, in emotional distress, um, it's important to be, to be kind and empathetic, uh, but also keep, keep things focused. Um, uh, it's, it's really important not to engage in any, uh, any questioning that could um, make somebody feel like there's victim blaming going on. You know, um, uh, remind the person that, or let the person know that they can take breaks, um, they can end the conversation at any time, um, and uh, that they can care for their own needs. Uh, when an investigation is pending, um, don't communicate uh, conclusive uh, determinations. Um, it can be tempting to in the moment when you're when you're empathizing with somebody who's uh, telling you about something that uh, that was very upsetting to them. Uh, it can be very tempting to say, "Oh, you know that what happened to you was um, you know was terrible. That's clearly a, client, a code of conduct violation. We need to ban this person." Um, you can empathize. Um, uh, and uh, and share, show compassion for somebody's experience without without agreeing with the final outcome, uh, because that that needs to go through a process before um, before any any decisions can be made. Uh, once an investigation is concluded, um, the code of conduct committee will generally meet and evaluate all the evidence and discuss and determine whether a violation occurred. And, and during that process, it's important to refer to the text of the Code of Conduct um, to determine what provisions of the Code of Conduct may have been violated. Uh, there are situations where a binary outcome of you know, violation or no violation is, is not necessarily essential. Um, and sometimes it's very subjective. Um, sometimes, uh, 
Sometimes there is behavior that's really kind of borderline in that, you know, it's impacted a lot of people negatively, but it's not such a clear case of whether or not this violated the code of conduct. Um, so in those situations, uh, it may still be helpful, whether there is a finding of violation or not, to have a conversation with the accused person and help them understand what the impact of their behavior was on, on others in the community. Uh, on deciding what the consequences and remedies should be, um, you know, this is this is both my personal view and I think uh, the view of uh, held by many many community, um, many open source community folks, uh, which is that the goal of code of conduct enforcement is not to punish anybody; it really is to safeguard the health and safety of uh, the community. And so, uh, in, in a couple slides later, we will talk about retributive versus uh, transformative and, and restorative justice and what that means. Um, so when a violation has occurred, um, consider the following factors when deciding upon what the consequences should be. So severity of the behavior itself, um, the risks and impact to the community of the behavior, uh, as well as the remedies that are under consideration. Um, also, whether the violators are uh, willing and able to learn from their mistakes. Um, you know, I, I do think that if somebody shows uh, genuine remorse and, and willingness to take responsibility for their actions, um, you know, lighter consequences, you know, perhaps a warning is sufficient. Uh, whereas if somebody really digs their heels in and, um, and is unwilling um, to accept responsibility, um, in that case, um, uh, more meaningful consequences to help them reflect um, uh, may, be, may be warranted. Also, uh, consider whether the problematic behavior is a single isolated incident or if it's a recurring pattern of behavior. Uh, in general, any permanent remedies uh, should only be imposed after the investigation and evaluation um, is completed. Um, but in some cases, uh, if the alleged violation uh, poses such an imminent, significant threat to a community, um, it, might be it might be necessary to uh, impose um, interim uh, interim protective measures immediately. Um, so, uh, for example, um, uh, I recently uh, assisted with a code of conduct uh, investigation where there was uh, there was a real th possible threat to community health and safety, and the decision was made to immediately uh, impose a temporary ban on this person from participating in the community uh, until the investigation was concluded, at which time it would be decided whether or not to, to uh, lift that uh, ban or, or make it permanent. Uh, so there's a lot of talk in code of conduct communities um, about restorative and transformative justice. And um, I find this one of the most exciting, uh, innovative areas of code of conduct enforcement. Um, so here are a few common theories of justice. Um, there, are, there are more theories than this, but these are, these are some of the most commonly um, cited ones um, today. So retributive justice um, is focused on punishment. Um, corrective justice uh, is focused on making the injured party whole. A restorative justice um, is uh, about restitution um, and healing harm um, with input from victims and offenders. And transformative justice um, is focused on restitution of larger societal injustices and systemic problems and equities. Uh, restorative justice is a theory and framework that was developed in the 1970s. Um, and in a traditional restorative justice process, um, the, the victim and um, the, the accused um, have a meeting and um, they talk about what happened. Um, and the, the thinking behind why that's restorative is um, it gives the accused person an opportunity to show remorse, um, to fully understand and internalize and appreciate the impact that their behavior had on the on the victim, um, and it also gives the victim an opportunity to speak their truth, um, to, to witness the accused person giving an apology, um, and uh, it, it, so it, it, the idea is that it facilitates uh, learning and healing between the victim and um, accused person. Um, but for that conversation to take place in a traditional restorative justice framework, the accused person has to take full responsibility. Um, for their actions and the impact. And um, in an ideal world, that would always happen, but that, that doesn't always happen. And I would say it, it rarely does. Um, 
it's challenging to apply this in code of conduct uh, resolution um, because of that prerequisite. Um, I mean, sometimes it will happen, uh, but also any conversation that takes place has to be voluntary. You cannot force people to speak to each other. Um, and uh, particularly for somebody who's uh, a victim or been harmed, um, you know, that could be re-traumatizing to them. Um, not all of them want to uh, speak to the person um, that they see as, uh, as a wrongdoer. Uh, transformative justice is a framework that evolved in the 90s in part uh, in, in response to what were received as the, uh, thank you, uh, the perceived failings and limitations of restorative justice. And transformative justice goes beyond just the, uh, the accused person and the victim. And it asks, what are the more systemic uh, societal and community issues um, that may have resulted in the, in the problematic behavior? And how do we how do we cure that? Um, so I'll just uh, I'll give an example for a crime of theft um, in a transformative justice framework. You know, we would be asking, you know, are there are there social inequities that contributed to that theft? Were there a lack of uh, opportunities for gainful employment? Um, was there were there other situations, duress, uh, influence um, from from family members or peers? Um, what were all the contributing factors in a community? Uh, questions that you might ask are. Um, you know, is, is there, are there ways in which this community is maybe implicitly encouraging or rewarding um, this bad behavior? You know, are project leaders modeling bad behavior? Are we failing to educate community members about acceptable uh, norms of how we treat each other? Um, Uh, so even though the traditional restorative justice uh, framework that involves a conversation between um, between accused and, and victim doesn't always doesn't always uh, work, um, I, I think that the general thinking about how do we create healing, um, how do we address harms, is a helpful question to ask um, during code of conduct enforcement, um, and how do we support the wrongdoer and, and other community members in learning and, and improving. Um, and then the transformative justice questions that I, I encourage all code of conduct um, responders to, to also ask is, um, you know, how do we how do we create resolution and healing in the broader community? And are there systemic issues in this community that have contributed um, to this uh, this issue? And how do we how do we as a community address those? Um, so uh, the traditional consequences in code of conduct enforcement are generally warning, a ban, whether it's temporary or permanent. Uh, sometimes a revocation of a leadership role or certain privileges, uh, again, either on a temporary or permanent basis. Um, more uh, trans restorative or transformative remedies might be a public or private apology, providing the accused person with training, coaching, or mentoring to improve their behavior, um, asking the accused, accused person to engage in some type of community service that helps um, that helps uh, in some ways address the, the, the harm that's related to their, their behavior. Um, in addressing other systemic issues. Um, we are running out of time. So I'm giving a talk tomorrow about mediation, particularly uh, transformative mediation, uh, which is a uh, newer approach to mediation as a tool for resolving incidents. So I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do a, a, a deep dive into that right now. Um, Uh, at the end of uh, an investigation, uh, it's, it's standard to notify both the accused and the reporters um, of uh, the results of the investigation. Um, and for the accused, um, letting them know what the behavior is that was at issue, why the behavior violated the code of conduct, um, how it impacts others in the community, what the remedies are, and, and what the appeal rights are, if, if any. Um, a few notes on um, managing communications. You know, one is that any message you send to an accused person um, or, or a reporter, it could be made public. You know, if, if they're unhappy for any reason, they could they could post it publicly. Um, uh, so just keep in mind that those are not those are not private communications. Um, and if there are going to be any public statements, it's important to go through an approval process for that. And if there's a risk of litigation or legal liability, um, have those run by legal counsel first. 
Um, after an investigation, consider the extent to which you want to make a public statement. Many code of conduct committees have transparency reports. Uh, most of those do not publicly identify uh, or name the accused person or the victims or witnesses. Um, they're just general, generic. Uh, some of them are just statistical um, statistics about, you know, we received X number of reports this year and found uh, Y number of violations. Um, some actually include summaries of the nature um, of the reported violation and whether a violation was actually found as well as a, a, a brief description of the consequences. Um, Are there any questions? We only have a couple minutes. Yes? Um, just a question. When you were talking about codes of conduct, how, how do you deal with layered situations? <coughs> you have a project, it went for the default code of conduct that so many young projects reach for. It goes into a nonprofit that might have its own code of conduct, and a violation happens at a conference run by the nonprofit. How do you layer those? Okay. Good question. So um, Stephen's question is about layered co codes of, code of conduct incidents where there might be a violation at a conference and it might be related to something that happened in a that an online community space um, and it might be a violation of both the project level and the foundation level and how do you deal with that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that is, uh, that's challenging, of course. Um, I can say within the LF, we're in the process of um, developing really clear documentation around um, jurisdiction and escalation. So, you know, what incidents are resolved at the project level, what incidents are, uh, are um, resolved at Linux Foundation, um, when there's going to be joint jurisdiction of a foundation code of conduct enforcement team and a project level. Um, uh, code of conduct enforcement team. Um, so I guess the answer is that it's going to depend on the community and the project and what the agreements are. And, and I, I would say that there are probably many projects who have not even thought through um, how to deal with that and therefore don't, don't have clear, clear guidelines. We're out of time, but I will, I will be in the hallway after this and happy to chat one-on-one -on -one with uh, any of you. Thank you.